Good afternoon, everyone. People are joining in. Good to have you here in one more afternoon for professional development. Welcome everyone to today's webinar. This is webinar number two of a series. And before I tell you more about our webinar series, let me introduce myself. I'm Katia Valle, Schools and Exams Marketing Manager, and I'm talking to you from Cambridge, Brazil's office in Sao Paulo. The idea behind these webinars is to contribute with your professional development. This week, we are focusing on primary, teaching very young children and very young learners too. So let's take a look at what we have been preparing for you. If you can move the slides, please. Yesterday, we had Learning to Learn, and the recording is already available in our Cambridge YouTube channel. Today, we are having Laura Sigsworth on the theme of how exploring nature benefits pre-primary learners. And tomorrow we are having Anne Robinson with the theme of developing positive attitudes. All of them at 3 p.m. Brazil time. Follow, up on, follow us up on social media to get all, all our updates. All these webinars have been communicated in Cambridge Brazil Instagram. And now let's have uh, a bit of housekeeping so that we have uh, a good webinar today. Please send your questions in the Q&A tool at the bottom of the screen. By the end of this presentation, we will have a link for feedback. And from this feedback form, you will get uh, a link to download your certificate. This webinar is going to be recorded and we will also upload the recording in Cambridge YouTube channel very soon. Today, we have the honor and the privilege of having with us Laura Sigsworth. She has almost 15 years of international experience in ELT, teaching young learners and working in school management in Indonesia, France, and the UK. Let's say hello to Laura. Laura, are you there? Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Great. Thanks very much for accepting our invitation for this webinar, Laura. No so. Problem. I hand over to you. Thank you very much. Have a good presentation. Thanks, Katja. Hi, everybody. I'm really pleased to be here. I'm excited to talk to you today about bringing nature into the class for pre-primary learners. This is my absolutely favorite age group to teach. And I've got two preschool age children myself. So I'm very well aware of the joys and the challenges of teaching this age group. So the plan for today, is to look at forest school. So what it is and what we can learn from it and what benefits it brings to young learners. Now, some of you might be based in cities or in urban environments. So I wanna say up front, this session is for everyone, wherever you are. Um, after talking about the benefits, I want to share some practical ideas for bringing nature into your classroom, whatever your setting. And then finally, I'll show how we've implemented some forest school ideas into our new pre-primary course, Green Man and the Magic Forest. So what is forest school? Sorry, my slides are a little bit slow today. Oh, there we go. So first of all, I'd like to ask you guys a couple of questions. So please be ready to type in the chat. Um, have a little look at these pictures. And our first question I'd like to ask you is, are these children learning? Are they learning? So just yes or no in the chat, are these children learning? Lovely, lots of yeses straight up front. 
Fabulous. Okay, so second question. What do you think they're learning? What are they learning in these pictures? Bonding, lovely. What else are they learning? Don't be shy. <laughs> Perfect, social skills and natural sciences, absolutely. Balance, yeah, physics, nature, weather, perfect. Discovering the world, lovely. Yeah, motor skills, nature colors, textures, exploring different possibilities, lovely. Empathy, absolutely. Lovely, some brilliant answers. And you can see there, just from the variety of your answers, um, you know, at this age, particularly at this age, everything, every environment is, is a learning opportunity, right? And nature, being in nature just provides a different environment, a different learning opportunity. So even though forest school is called forest school, it uh, actually just means nature school. So um, it's called forest school because the idea came out of Scandinavia, but the approach can be done in any environment, in any classroom. Um, it's just about the children developing an understanding and appreciation of nature. So forest schools, a little bit of background, um, they were born out of an understanding of the importance of nature in children's education and development. They first appeared in Scandinavian countries like Denmark in the 1950s. And then the first forest schools appeared in the UK in the early 1990s and um, are also spread worldwide. According to the definition by the Forest School Association, so that's the UK based organization that um, looks after forest schools. A forest school is a child-centered inspirational learning opportunity that offers opportunities for holistic growth. It's a program that encourages play, exploration and supported risk-taking and children develop confidence and self-esteem through hands-on experiences that can be linked to the curriculum in a natural setting. Children have the freedom to explore using multiple senses and it accommodates different learning styles. So here in the UK, uh, most forest schools tend to be extracurricular, um, you know, something that children do outside of their normal school hours. But many primary schools are now incorporating some forest school learning into their school curriculum. So, for example, my local primary school um, is lucky enough to be by a little wood and uh, the students have one or two hours a week in the wood um, doing forest school activities. So what's the point? Why would we do this? Um, and I think you've already touched on some of the reasons why in your comments earlier. Um, but there are five sort of broadly five key benefits for learning in or about nature. So four for the child and one for the planet. And this is all backed up by a study into forest schools in England and Wales uh, that show really clear benefits uh, for the students. So number one, intellectual benefits. Um, so that nature offers these authentic opportunities for discovery, for creativity, for problem solving, and it allows learners to explore and experiment. Next, there are emotional benefits. Um, I mean, you guys will know if you go for a walk in nature, you feel calmer. Uh, and that's the same for children. It offers a nature is calming and it offers a change of place, uh, pace from the classroom and uh, helps children develop more confidence. There are social benefits. Children develop social skills and because they're interacting with each other, they're doing team activities, they're participating in games and play. And importantly, uh, for us, language development is prompted by children's sensory experiences. You know, we know that children want to communicate about the different things that they see, hear, 
and do. And that's exactly the same in a forest environment. It's just they're communicating about different things because they're experiencing a different environment. Uh, physical benefits, so physical skills were found to improve. Um, outdoor activities helped to develop stamina and motor skills in young children. And I actually recently saw a study about um, the benefits of being playing outdoors to children's microbiome and their immune systems and their gut bacteria um, because they're interacting with different types of, of bacteria, I guess, out in the natural world. And finally, environmental. So children develop uh, an interest in their natural surroundings and a respect for the environment. Of course, you know, this is possibly number one benefit for us. You know, these children are the next generation, the next sort of custodians of our planet. So what are the children doing in the forest? What types of activities? Um, so these are some typical forest school types of activities. So we've got observation so of the natural world, uh, creatures in their natural habitats. You've got investigation and experimentation, including projects like planting things. Uh, activities involving movement, so climbing, running, going under and over things. And then finding and making things. Um, building shelters is, is, is a big one, but also doing arts and crafts using natural materials. And of course, all of these activities can be done in any natural environment and many of them can be adapted for the classroom. So for example, you could do craft activities or build shelters indoors. You can grow plants on a classroom windowsill, um, look for nature in a school playground or through a window. But all of these activities offer opportunities to use different types of language than and may be used in a, in a regular classroom. Um, so it's just about naturally introducing new vocabulary in context. So these are some of the key principles of forest school. And they're also quite useful when we think about bringing nature into a classroom environment. So number one, forest school is a long-term process of regular sessions rather than one-off or infrequent visits. Um, so this helps learners build confidence being in the natural environment and they're able to see how things change over time. So with the seasons or different weather. Number two, forest school takes place in a natural environment. And this is just about helping learners build, build that relationship, you know, relationship with nature. And of course, it may not always be possible to do it in a natural environment, depending on where you are. But there are ways to bring that natural environment into the classroom that will uh, talk about in more detail later. Number three, Forest School uses a range of learner-centered processes to create a community for being, development, and learning. And actually what that just, just what that means is that learners tend to be self-directed. So they're choosing how and, and what they want to explore. Uh, this is quite a common practice in sort of more like Montessori style education but elements of it can, can actually be quite useful in a more traditional classroom environment as well. Number four, Forest School aims to promote the holistic development of all involved. So this will be very familiar to you. We know our students, particularly at this age, they're like little sponges. They're developing so much more than just language. They're developing social skills and life skills and learning skills. Uh, and there's, you know, Forest School is no different. And finally, a forest school offers learners the opportunity to take supported risks uh, appropriate to the environment and to themselves. So these don't necessarily have to be physically risky, um, although things like uh, using knives, good practice using knives, and, and, and cooking with fire and climbing and balancing are all part of forest school practice, uh, slightly. <laughs> to my horror as a parent, but, um, but you know, these risks could be social risks, you know, interacting with new people and also language risks. So getting the confidence to communicate, maybe even in, in English. So before I get into specific ideas, um, I want to just look at those principles and think about how we can adapt them for the English classroom. 
because as I said, not everyone will have regular access to a natural environment, but it doesn't mean we can't explore nature themes indoors or in a playground. So long term and regular. I think this is quite important, particularly at, at this age, we know young learners thrive off routines you know the first thing you first time you introduce something new you'll have the kids who hang back the hesitant ones people who don't really know what's going on but you know by the third or fourth or fifth time that you're doing it you know the students pick up the routine they understand it so it's really important to make these um these activities part of your classroom routine um so things like planting seeds and watching them grow um, you could have a rotor for, for watering the plants and that allows learners to take responsibility for, for something. Herbs is quite a good option. And observing how those plants change over time. But repeated or, or long term activities like this can be done with loads of things that are not difficult to do. So, you know, starting every class with what's the weather like today and talking about how it's different from last time you've had class. Um, talking about if it, oh, it's windy, the clouds are moving, just allowing that space to notice and to observe, you know, their wider environment. Story time is a really lovely way to, to bring nature into a classroom environment. And I'll talk a little bit later about some um, stories later on. So the second principle was being in a natural environment. Of course, that's that's a forest school thing because forest school is a for, is is in nature. But there's no reason we can't bring things from outside into the classroom. So, you know, shells or sticks, leaves, interesting pine cones or seeds. Um, and while you might say, okay, messy play is an outdoor thing, yeah, absolutely. Um, and as a parent, I hate it. Um, but you know, we can replicate some of the experiences of messy play so those textures that sensory experience we can do that but with less messy things so things like play-doh or balls pom-poms shredded paper crinkly cellophane and maybe even dry, dried food like um, pasta or oats or corn flour a third principle learner centered um for a school as I said, learners tend to be self-directed. They follow their interests. Now, that not, might, might not always be practical in a, in a preschool environment where you have, you know, you've got learning goals. Um, but one way to do it is, is to have stations. So you have four or five, six, however many different stations in the classroom and you rotate the students or those students rotate themselves around the stations. Um, if there are ways to adapt activities to, to engage children using their interests, that can also really be helpful with, with motivation and appeal to different learning preferences. So for example, you might have a student who's you know, not that bothered about coloring or drawing or mark making, um, but you can potentially support that student towards holding a pencil and using it nicely by saying, okay, this kid, Jerry is, He's really into cars. Let's encourage him to draw his favorite car, for example. Number four, holistic development. That's already such a core part of the pre-primary class. And, you know, we, we know that students are learning so much more than just language when they're, when they're coming to class. And finally, supported risks. Um, said before, they don't have to be physical risks. They could be language risks. However, if you want to include some movement or balance activities, uh, something like an obstacle race indoors or this uh, picture on the left, you can see is almost like a, I want to say crystal maze. I don't know if that's the right thing. Sort of crystal maze uh, strings between trees or between parts of the classroom. And that's a really nice way to practice uh, movement language, you know, jump over, crawl under, etc. So now let's talk about some specific activities that we can try with your class. So these activities, most of these activities can be adapted to wherever you are. If you can get out into nature, great. Otherwise, a playground or even a classroom is absolutely fine. 
just a few practicalities first. So these activities are not designed to be like an extra thing you have to put on your list. You know, you, you're busy people. You've got loads that you've got to do, right? You don't, it's not, they're not designed to be onerous or difficult. They're designed to be adaptable and support your language goals. And if they're not supportive of your language goals, then, you know, choose something else. <laughs> um, it's, it, make it easy, you know. And as I said before, having stations can help if you've got, particularly if you've got a large class dividing children between stations and if it's helpful, set a time limit. So rotate every, every few minutes. And do use L1 as necessary, you know, students need help understanding. Some of the language that you know, they might encounter talking about nature is not necessarily the most useful language they're gonna learn in their lives. It might be something like snail, or it might be a type of tree or, um, but, you know, support them. They don't necessarily need that language in English. So a little quiz. Can you remember what the four types or four categories for school activities were? Get your fingers ready. Uh, little type in the chat. Can you remember what the four types of forest school activities were? Lovely. Observation. Brilliant. Investigation. Thank you. Movement. Absolutely. Can you remember the final one? Finding and making things. Well done. Perfect. There we go. So we're going to look at each category in turn and then I'll suggest activities um, that can be adapted for the classroom. So the first category is observation. And in this type of activity, we're encouraging students to notice the natural environment around them. And this is a really great way, um, this might sound a bit strange, this is a really nice way to introduce basic mindfulness techniques as well. So one activity idea is uh, using a nature table. Um, so bring in interesting things, pine cones, shells, stones, herbs, anything really from outside. Um, and to ask children to talk about how they smell, feel, or look, get them to interact with the items. This could even be a, a permanent corner of your classroom and you can rotate the items around according to what topic you're doing. So if you were covering, I don't know, the seaside, you could have shells and um, little fish and, and things like that. Um, you can see here, this, this is an autumn nature table. So it's got little foresty autumn animals on it. Or an adaptation to this is having a mystery box. So learners take it in turns to put their hands in and, and feel what they can, they can talk, talk about what they can feel. And feel free to pre-teach vocabulary at this point as well. But the nice thing about this activity is it can be, it's really adaptable. So you can adapt it to your syllabus. If you you can use the items to do counting, um, you can ask the students to group things by color or by size, or you could even use it as prompts for, for stories or creative play. If you bring in a few little toy animals um, or people, then that can be the beginning of a story. If you have access to a playground or outdoor space, um, a, bunk, a bug hunt is a really nice idea. So encouraging learners to find and observe different bugs. Now, I know that not all bugs are necessarily friendly. So use your own uh, discretion for this. Um, but it's a nice way to start discussing things, habitats, for example. So um, looking under logs, uh, seeing that the uh, beetles, like the wet and the dark, um, you know, we know that worms like to live in the ground. Um, what are the ants doing? Are they carrying something? Where are they going? Um, it, it just prompts a lot of language. If you're indoors, um, you can do this activity, but just using pictures or toy bugs. And you can see here, you've got a little checklist. So um, with visual prompts as well, so students can go around and they can tick off when they find uh, that particular 
real or pretend bug. A nice follow up for this activity for more advanced students is to uh, guess the bug. So if you have uh, some bug flashcards or a little models even, um, one student has the model or the picture and the other student has some prompt cards. And I've got some, here's some I made earlier. So you can see that they, well, don't know if you can see because my book, well, I'll just have to tell you about them. Sorry about that. Um, so it's where do they live? Um, how many legs have they got? What color is it? Uh, is it big or small? Has it got wings? Um, and play a little guess the bug. On to the next one. So three things. This is a really lovely activity if you've got an overtired or an overstimulated class. Um, it just introduces very basic mindfulness techniques um, and the develops the skill of, of noticing. Um, so either indoors or outdoors, ask children to sit or lie down and tell them to take a few deep breaths and just look in front of them and choose three things that they can see. So it might be the clock on the wall, um, the classroom poster and the clouds in the sky outside. They don't shout out, so no shouting out. Just choose three things and then choose one of those three things and just watch it, look at it. Ask them some questions. So what does it, what's it doing? Is it moving? Is the, maybe the tree is waving its branches or the clouds are moving in the sky? Is it fast or slow? What shape is it? Then you might say, next, focus on your ears. We're going to listen. What can you hear? Don't shout out. Maybe they can hear birds. Maybe there's traffic outside. Choose one thing they can hear and just listen to it. And then you focus on touch. So... What can they feel under their hands? Maybe they can feel the grass or the carpet or their clothing. What does it feel like? Is it rough, smooth? Does it feel nice? And then bring the children back and get them to share the three things that they saw, heard, and felt. Now that might, if, if that feels a bit ambitious, if you've got a really boisterous class and you think that's never gonna work, um, there are lots of really lovely uh, guided meditation stories online. You can find YouTube videos which talk students through a journey uh, that's sort of meditation-y. Um, but I particularly like this one because it's about that just listening and looking and, and being in the environment. So the second type of activity was investigation and experimentation. So these activities allow students to follow their natural curiosity and learn while doing. And these uh, activities work quite well as stations around the playground or classroom as well. So gravity, if you watch preschoolers for any length of time, you know, of course, that they love things with wheels. They love rolling objects, balls, things that move. So this, these, this type of activity takes advantage of that. In, in the picture, you can see the children are rolling um, shaky eggs down a pipe uh, that's on a hill. Um, but you can use any tube or ramp, you can use balls or cars or I mean, anything really, but it's just getting students to observe and experiment different objects and different angles and seeing how, um, how it changes. You can also get children to, to compare different objects dropped from a height and get them to predict which one's gonna hit the ground first. So feathers versus stones or paper versus the razor. And then a similar experiment can be done with a, with a tub of water. So give students different things to experiment to see if they sink or float. And that introduces some sort of basic language like fast, slow, heavy, light, uh, comparison language. Messy play. So a nice idea for messy play is to do um, recipes. So ask students to either make a new recipe or create uh, or provide recipe cards like you can see in the picture here. 
um, to, and and let them tick off as they go. So you can use in here, then if you've got access to a mud kitchen, obviously you've got mud and water and you've got pineapple tops. And um, I think the pan has uh, water with flowers in it. Um, but if you're indoors and you don't want the mess, uh, using toy food or um, dried food or you know, leaves and, and things, it's absolutely perfect as well. Um, and then students talk about what they've made and more advanced students can tick things off a clipboard as they go and talk about what they've made. Outdoor art is, is one of my favorites because it keeps the children really get into it. Um, so taking using non-toxic water-based paint or chalk outside and just experimenting with it on different surfaces, you know, seeing how it changes, if it's on something bumpy or, um, or something smooth. So it talks about talking about textures, experimenting with how different colors change, how they mix together. Um, and if you're indoors, you can easily do this. You can paint on stones or, or leaves. Um, bubbles as well is also a really popular one. Um, and it can be done really simply from using washing up liquid and hoops of wire, or you can get those huge bubble, almost rope things as well, um, that are also really popular and really great if it's if you're outdoors and it's windy. So a few uh, creative activities using natural materials. So wind sticks, tying ribbon to sticks and using uh, them to see which way the wind is blowing, see if it's windy. Leaf or flower crowns, so gluing, thing, gluing natural things to uh, rectangles of paper and then can be fastened to make a crown. Tree faces, this is one of my particular favorites because it's just such a great prompt for language. Um, so in this case, they're using clay to give a tree a face, so like a personality for the tree. Um, and you then create the kind of features with sticks and stones and, and whatever else you find outside. But very easily you can use Play-Doh instead. Um, but it's such a brilliant prompt for language because you can uh, talk about well, for a start, you talk about describing language. So what do they look like? Talk about what they use to create the faces. Talk about how the faces feel, so emotion. Um, talk about giving them, them a personality. So this tree likes playing football. I, you know, such a great prompt for language because they're create, almost creating their own characters. And then finally, leaf painting or stone painting or using leaves or sticks or stones as paint brushes and dipping them into the paint and seeing what shapes they make. Um, all of these activities, I suppose you can make the wind sticks and not use them indoors, that'd be fine. But pretty well, all of them can be done in the classroom. And the important thing is using them then as a prompt to uh, talk about what they've made, talk about how they made them. Building shelters. Now, this is kind of number one forest school activity. And I don't know about you, but my construction skills are not, not brilliant. Um, it's a really popular forest school activity, but it can really easily um, be adapted to the classroom. So either you build, the, you know, use sheets and things to build dens in the classroom. Um, or you do micro shelters for toys. So this is a really nice way of developing um, creativity and gross and fine motor skills and problem solving. And if you've got students working together on building a little shelter for their, um, I think their dogs, dog and a polar bear maybe, um, then you, they're, they're developing teamwork skills as well. And then the final category of activity was active language practice. So incorporating learning and movement. Really great for kinesthetic learners. Um, really great for consolidating language. So you've learned something and you just want to, want to practice it in a physical way. Just gonna have a drink here. So the first idea is a scavenger hunt. This is a 
great way to practice language and you can really just make your own list of whatever you want to get them to find incorporating whatever language you're learning at the time so if you're learning colors you go find something red uh, numbers find three stones um, textures find something bumpy um, if you're not able to go outside for, for your scavenger hunt you can easily use classroom objects um, as treasures as well Another variation on this is to go on a little animal safari. So place your pictures of animals or toy animals around the playground or the classroom. And at each station, students perform an action um, associated with the animal. So you roar like a lion, for example. And then a nice follow-up activity to that is to ask students to try and remember what animals they saw in what order, just by making noises or doing the actions. And a treasure hunt. This activity takes a little bit of preparation, but I mean, who doesn't love a treasure hunt? Um, you'll need to draw a simple map or prepare instructions to read aloud, depending on how well your student, you think your students will be able to understand the concept of a, of a map. Um, so the map or the instructions should um, uh, show or describe a route around your learning space, so the classroom, the outdoor space, and then just make sure there's something exciting at the end that's worth finding. So tell the children, going to be pirates who are looking for treasure. Uh, give them copies of the map and um, or read the instructions aloud, and then uh, accompany them as they follow their um, follow the instructions to discover their treasure. It's quite nice to use a bit of imagination here. So watch out for the whale. Um, and then afterwards they can they can draw their own uh, treasure maps or create their own treasure routes to treasure. Really lovely for movement and descriptive language, you know, so you go around the big tree um, and that sort of thing. Another really easy way to incorporate movement into vocabulary or phonics practice is to set up a hopscotch with flashcards on the floor. So children take it in turns in, in kind of relay style. So depending on how many children you have in your class, uh, you have, you know, how many teams, uh, then they line up, you shout out a a vocabulary item and get students to jump on the correct flashcard. So having all the you know, various flashcards on the floor. Um, you can do this with letters. So you can get them to, to jump on the letter C, for example. Um, or you could even do it for, for older or more advanced students. You can do it for um, spelling practice. So uh, say you shout out cat and then the, the children, the child jumps C-A-T and then goes to find the cat flashcard that's on the wall. So I previously mentioned that um, stories are such a lovely way to bring nature and sustainability values into the classroom. Here are just a few of my favorites. Um, Tilly plants a tree is about a little squirrel who um, who goes to visit her grandmother's oak tree that she planted when she was a little girl. And she's so inspired that she gets an acorn to plant her own oak tree. And what I like about it is it's quite descriptive about, um, first of all, about how the seed, you put the seed in soil and the little sprout comes out. It, it describes the process really nicely, but it also shows the nurturing that it takes to, to look after a plant. Uh, Maisie grows a garden is similar in that sense. It's, it's showing you know, nurturing, uh, nurturing plants. We're going on a bear hunt. I really like because it's such an adventurous book. I'm sure you guys are, are familiar, very familiar with it. Um, and I like the kind of, um, oh, what's the word? When uh, it's, it's such a nice book to read aloud. Um, and it's uh, also got lovely movement language in it as well. Uh, Eric Carle, that's um, Hungry Caterpillar Fame, 
Um, but he's also written The Tiny Seed, which is a lovely book, again, about uh, a growing seed. And finally, Sally and the Limpet is actually one of my absolute favourites um, uh, books because you, quite, you see quite often a lot of books that are based in nature in forests or nature in gardens, but you don't necessarily often see stuff happening at the seaside. Um, and this story is about little Sally who goes to the seaside and she gets a limpet stuck on her finger. That's one of those, you know, really um, shells that are usually stuck to rocks really hard and they're possible to get off. Um, so she gets a limpet stuck to her finger and she can't get it off, no, no matter what she tries. And everybody tries to help her get this limpet off. And then she gets so fed up of, of people trying to poke and prod at her that she just runs back to the beach. And the minute she's in the water, the limpet pops off because it's back in its natural environment, it's back at home. I just think that's such a nice way of describing, uh, you know, respecting leaving creatures in their natural habitat and understanding that, that you know, they have homes too. I think that's really lovely. Um, if you don't have access to English versions where you are, um, you can find most of these read aloud on YouTube as well. And books, uh, you know, such a fantastic way to introduce new topics and language and, um, you know, start starting a topic, introducing a topic, um, but also as a way of consolidating language. So um, remembering and what they've learned and, and uh, seeing it applied in a story. And so you can use books uh, that way, but you can also use books directly in activities. And here's a, an extra activity idea if you're using these or any stories um, and it's focusing on observation. So you tell students, uh, guys, you're gonna be book detectives today, um, looking for clues in books. You make sure they have a really good selection of books available to them. And you also give them a little checklist, almost like a bingo card of things to find in the books. Um, so books that work well are books that have lots of pictures in. So I don't know if you can see that. Mm. It's a book about nature. It's just got loads and loads of different animals in it. So books that've got lots of going, lots going on, really. Um, and students go through the books and they're looking for the things on their on their bingo card. And when they find them, they stick a little post-it on the snail, whatever they're looking for, um, and they tick it off their their bingo card. Um, and you can do this with anything. So if you're if you're learning about animals, brilliant. That's a great way of looking for animals. If you're learning about um, jobs, you know you can have books about jobs. If you're learning about um, actions, you can do different actions. So you know, find someone who's running, find someone who's riding a bike. Um, really, it can be used in any way, and it can also be used um, with letters. So you can ask them to find particular letters as well. If they're a bit, if they're starting to do a little bit of reading. Uh, that's the you can see that's the, 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 the example there in the picture. So we've talked about forest school and the forest school principles and bringing those into the classroom. So what might that look like in a course book? So our course, Green Man and the Magic Forest, um, includes a forest fun activity book, which is inspired, directly inspired by the forest school approach. Um, if you don't, if you're not familiar with Green Man and the Magic Forest, it's a three level course for three to six year olds. And the new edition came out just this year. Um, and the course follows the adventures of Sam, Nico and their forest friend, Green Man, with beautiful stories and themes of bringing, being friends to nature. The course is designed to nurture young learners as they learn a new language, helping them develop confident social interactions and a caring approach to nature. So it really takes a whole child approach to learning, putting nature at the centre and helping children engage and explore their surroundings through enchanting stories. Um, and you'll notice, of course, that this matches really closely with the forest school um, approach. And in fact, the, the second edition, as I said, includes this new uh, Forest Fun Activity Books, 
um, inspired, directly inspired by the Forest School approach. And it's designed, the activities are designed to be really flexible. So options for inside and outside the classroom. Um, so in this, this activity, you can see um, the students are looking at finding and coloring the animals in the forest. So that's really already starting to bring in this idea of observation and looking for something. So here we go, we've got another page of observation. This time it's looking at clouds and looking for shapes in clouds. And of course this can be done outside or it could be done inside the classroom. Um, benefits like knowledge and understanding of their environment, communication and motivation. There are also creative activities, which um, as we've talked about, develop confidence and motivation. So this uh, little making a stick figure using natural materials. So again, you can, like we talked about, bring in some things from, from outside if you're not outside already. There are also physical activities. Um, so uh, little, there are yoga videos included to try with your class. Um, and that touches a bit on the mindfulness that we talked about. It's really good for students to sort of be present in their bodies and feel and notice and observe and move. And there are also activities that um, promote values. Uh, so uh, sharing, for example, you can see here, this is all about um, making sand art for making a picture for a friend. But also caring for the environment. So um, things like uh, reusing old clothes. Um, so it, planting plants in, in wellies or um, painting, uh, painting, a, painting, a, oh yeah, to creating a new t-shirt art. Um, and also things like picking up litter. And if you're interested in finding out more about Green Man, I think Kat just put a, a link in the chat there for you. But just to recap what we've um, talked about this session, because we've covered quite a lot, and I think some people probably missed a little bit. Um, we've covered lots of different activity ideas today. So here's a little list if you want to take a picture or you want to remind you of it. So we've looked at ideas for observation, so the nature table, bug hunt, the mindfulness and the book detectives. Ideas for investigation and experimentation, so gravity, experiments with gravity, messy play using um, recipes, uh, outdoor art and bubbles. And then for find and make, we had wind sticks, um, nature crowns, tree faces, leaf painting or painting anything really, um, and mini shelters. And then movement, we had the scavenger hunt, the animal safari, the treasure hunt, and the flashcard hopscotch. And we saw lots of benefits of bringing um, nature into the classroom for, for our young learners by adopting some of these forest school techniques. So it's a brilliant tool for skills development, so life skills, learning skills, social skills. Um, it helps engage and motivate and helps with anxiety. It offers different opportunities for creative expression and experimentation. Um, there's opportunities for cross-curricular learning. So um, people mention science as well, and biosciences, but um, you know, really cross-curricular with, with lots of different things. Um, promotes curiosity about the natural world and how the world works. Being in a different environment stimulates different language. I think that's really important. Um, you know, when, when we're only in one environment all the time or we're only experiencing one experience, we're only able to communicate about that experience. But the minute you expose students and give students the opportunity to have a different experience, they're going to start producing and wanting to produce different language. And then finally, perhaps most importantly, it's really about promoting an appreciation of nature in, in, in our next generation, you know, the future custodians of the planet. And this is one of my particular favorite quotes from Stephen Moss, who's a naturalist. 
nature's a tool to get students to uh, children to experience not just the wider world but themselves so that's it from me thanks so much everybody i've had a lovely time and um, thanks for all your participation Great, Laura. Thank you very much for your presentation, inspiring presentation, full of practical ideas to take to the classroom tomorrow or next week. Uh, have you tried any of the ideas that Laura shared or did you feel inspired to bring something, to take something to your classroom? Let's hear participants. Thanks, everybody. If you take just one activity, I'll be so happy. <laughs> right. Uh, a question, in fact, a comment just popped up. Tatiana Borges uh, says that she started teaching with Green Man for kids of, uh, for three year old kids. And for her, it's been a big challenge. Perhaps she is a novice teacher or it's her first experience uh, for very young learners. Uh, do you have any kind of advice, Laura, to Tatiana? Absolutely. I remember my I remember my first preschool lesson so well. It was a total disaster. And in fact, that whole term was a total disaster. And then what happened was I um I observed uh, a teacher who'd been doing it for, for a little while, and that was the most helpful thing. The minute I watched someone do it properly, um, I was like, I, something clicked. And I think, um, so definitely if you've got the opportunity to, to watch um, other teachers, um, that's great. But I think num my number one get out of jail free card with preschoolers is routine. You know, start a routine and do the same routine every day. Uh, you, you, you tweak the bits in between the routine, but if you start with a hello song, you end with a goodbye song, you have a tidy up song in there somewhere. That's, um, that's my number one um, tip. <laughs> Great, Laura. Thanks for your advice. Well, lots of positive uh, comments in the chat. Carla is telling us that they have a gardening class for their kindergartens elementary schools and their teachers have already done some of your activities and will surely do others too. Great to hear that. Oh, I think one more question just popped up. Ah, uh, Tatiana just thanked for your advice and I don't think we have any more. So tomorrow we are having one more webinar at three in the afternoon with Anne Robinson on positive attitudes. And next week we are having webinars every day. So please follow Cambridge Brazil on social media, especially Instagram, because we will be communicating all these webinars there. You also have in the chat the link for feedback and also access to your certificate. Caroline Laura is saying that they use an app that shows what plant is just by taking photos. Wow, I have to look that up. I'm rubbish at remembering plant names, so that'd be super useful. <laughs> Let me see if we have any other questions to you. Uh, Tatiana again is asking if it's possible to buy puppets from Green Man. Uh, talk to our attendimento, uh, Tatiana. We need to, to check where you are teaching. I'm writing down here their email about puppets. All right. So I don't see any further questions here, Laura. I would like to thank you very much for bringing us this interesting presentation. Thank you everyone for participating. And tomorrow we are going to be together again at three. Thanks, Laura. Thanks so much, everybody. Lovely to see you all. <laughs> see you, take care. Bye. Bye.